Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Now available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, PodcastOne.com, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Welcome, you're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. That's Tim Dennis. Hello, Tim. Hey, how you doing? Good. Hey, listen, I uh, you know, I did something uh, a couple months back that really seemed to impact the audience. Um, after years of talking about trying some of the different uh, the methodologies and modalities out there that we've talked to guests on our show for for years... I finally took the plunge, and we we shared a whole episode on my journey. Uh, I did an ayahuasca journey, Mm -hmm. Um, and still very profound to this day. I mean, it's just, uh, I I, I think about it every day. Think about different aspects of it. I, I, you know, at at the time it said, I I don't know if I'm going to need to do one again because it was so profound. And now here we are a couple months later, and I could see totally wanting to to tap back into that again because it's not that you forget – but you do feel distanced by it. And it's not like an addictive, I I need to get back to that feeling. It was just that I I was so impressed with the download of information and everything that took place. And we had GK on the show who walked us through. uh, She was my, my um, uh, facilitator on the journey Mm -hmm. and walked us through and, and we had a great conversation, but I was left with more questions and I figured, you know, I'd like to get some answers from another source and that's that's what we're going to do today. Uh, our guest is uh, Dr. Carl Kalaman, who holds a PhD in physical biology and has served as an expert on chemical carcinogens for the World Health Organization. He began his studies on the Mayan calendar in 1979 and now lectures throughout the world. He is also author of The Purposeful Universe, Solving the Greatest Mystery of Our Time, the Mayan Calendar, and uh, the Mayan Calendar and the Transformation of Consciousness. He lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The new book that's out that we're going to be discussing is Quantum Science of Psychedelics, The Pineal Gland, Multidimensional Reality, and Mayan Cosmology. Thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate you joining us, Dr. Kalaman. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Dave. I'm looking forward to this, and it's especially good to have talked to somebody who has a personal experience of of these kind of things. Well, you know, a lot of people, when you bring up the term psychedelics, they automatically start thinking 60s hippies and just uh, getting high, not that there's anything really transformative about it. Um, I'd like a little bit of your concept in in understanding uh, psychedelics as it were and I, I do do you wish there was a better term for that uh that didn't have that same kind of hippie connotation to it nowadays yes absolutely and of course there, there there's been all these suggestions you know some people talk about entheogens uh and then some others uh, would talk about plant medicines and uh, um, and and it's little, it's very tricky with this because the as you exactly as you're saying the the word psychedelics it brings up completely different uh, thoughts uh, ab- about what it's about c- compared to what I associate with it because I wasn't part of that '60s uh, uh, movement you might say um, and and so, so uh, some people would simply uh, uh, avoid the whole thing just by because of the term and, and because of the, how it was perceived in those days. And uh, sometimes I, I think it, people were a little bit crazy in those days. And uh, now it's come to have a completely different meaning. And uh, there's coming all these uh, uh, s- scientific studies from very reputable places were showing that this is a very powerful uh, uh, therapeutic tool. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I 
Um, who knows? I mean, I could have tr uh, used another term, and maybe if my publisher would have accepted that in, in the title of the book, but then people might not even have un understood what it was about. You know, if you talk about plant medicine, well, there's right. a million d different plant medicines, and, and what I'm addressing is really that that creates a kind of uh, um, transference to um, another state of consciousness. Right. And, and that's what I said. I'm not putting down. I mean, obviously, the book sells it when you say these words, people get an understanding for it. But I think there's such a stigma attached to it that people yeah. are robbing themselves of enlightenment um, by just uh, assuming you're talking about LSD or some some other kind of uh, drug that is not really necessarily. Um, God, I'm trying to find the right term here. It's not something that that is uh, mind expanding, but mind altering. And maybe you could explain that to our listeners uh, with psychedelics and um, ayahuasca, other plant medicines. What is the difference between mind altering and mind opening? Or are they interchangeable terms that are just used depending on who's who's doing the conversation? I think those are alternate terms. And I, I wouldn't be... Um, I wouldn't be able to give good definitions that would discern between the two. Uh, um, mind opening. But what, what I'm talking about is really mind disengaging. Um, and, and that, of course, implies a, a particular definition of mind as the, the kind of structured um, geometric mind that we live with in, in our d default state, so to speak. And that particular mind is being disengaged by the use of, temporarily, I, I should say, uh, by the use of, of uh, uh, psychedelics. And you might say it opens a mind. Yeah, sure, uh, it, it does. If, if, if that structured mind is disengaged, it, it does mean that the mind is open to uh, uh, the cosmos, I would say, to uh, much broader influences than, than it is in its normal default state. See, well, that, that's, I guess, where so many people have written to me after my journey, uh, you know, and I don't know how to answer these questions. When, when you talk about this consciousness and the, the structured mind, there's, there doesn't really seem to be a way uh, replicable that I'm aware of to show people what that actually means. When people listen, they said, you know, your story was great. I'm glad that it impacted you, but Dave, you were just high. Your, your brain, <laughs> was, your brain was creating this illusion and you weren't. And I'm like, man, if I'm high, uh, I, I, you know, I had, I had truly religious experiences. I had some life altering moments, things, knowledge that was given to me that I had not had before. It was, it was truly enlightening at risk of overusing that word. Um, it was something different. I've been high. I've smoked weed in the past. And, uh, you know, I, I got to be honest with you, that's about the extent of it. Um, I fear of, of any other drug and what the long term effects have always kept me away from it. But I've been high and I've had those moments and I've been drunk and I've had those moments and I've been sleep deprived <laughs> and I've had those moments and they can't even come into the same context as the plant medicine and the experience that I had, uh, you know, how, how do we get the mainstream world to examine the fact that you're, you're pushing past the construct of what we think we understand and that we are truly accessing something outside of just mm. chemical firings and electrical storms that might be taking place in our brain that these drugs are are creating, which I think is what most people or a good portion of people believe is really what's going on. Yeah, well, I, I would say this is exactly the reason this book was written. So it's a, a fairly deep uh, going book that really, I, I think, scientifically demonstrates that the kind of experiences you have there are not produced by your brain in isolation. Um, it, the, the starting point then really is to look at uh, are all all levels of the mind, all possible consciousness of, of the mind. It's not really that's produced by the brain. Uh, 
these these states are downloaded from the cosmos and that's really also what what i th- think is is why it is necessary to bring in not only quantum theory which is all about different states uh, uh, alternate states uh, uh, of reality, but also the the whole Mayan cosmology, which is based on the idea that that the evolution of the cosmos, including of the human beings, is based on of of a uh, uh, on on you might say macrocosmic quantum states, an evolution. Uh, through stepwise higher and higher uh, quantum states, and uh, our our mind is not a, produ- uh, pr- a production just of our b- brains. Rather, uh, our our brains is is a unit that download cosmic information, and is is from that interaction of those cosmic waves that. Uh, um, we uh, uh, our, our minds are produced. Um, uh, 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 there is no, there, unless we had this cosmic contact, which pr- creates different kinds of mind. I, I, I would say we well then uh, uh, then we wouldn't have any mind. Then we wouldn't experience anything. And so once you come to recognize that kind of an origin of, of the human mind as a download from the cosmos, then you can start to understand that if you take certain kinds of plant medicines like, like ayahuasca or something like that, it will change the, the resonance pattern uh, or it will, uh, uh, it will change the, the particular way in which the brain receives cosmic information and then you can understand why is it that uh, we can by taking these kind of plant medicines that we can just move into a different world of experience and it's not you know i I shouldn't say it's the brain has nothing to do with it that wouldn't be true but to say that it's produced in the brain is also completely false. Uh, rather, it is something, or, or it's an interaction between cosmic waves um, that the Maya would, uh, in their terminology, talk about plumed as uh, plumed serpents, and uh, that's why so many people have serpent visions when, when they take uh, ayahuasca. Oh, okay. Oh, holy eye opener! Thank you for that. See, I when I went into this. I, um, I jokingly had told the facilitator, I said, uh, you know, she said, do you have any worries or concerns? I said, listen, I'm terrified of <laughs> death, death and snakes. I don't want to have a bad trip and see a snake. She's like, nope, nobody has bad trips. Trust me on this one. You know, I'm, I'm here to facilitate you. Uh, the, the plant medicine will know. And again, this sounds so hippy dippy. The plant medicine will know. And I had serpent encounters but it was nothing terrifying uh, as a matter of fact uh dr kellerman it removed that fear i have a healthy respect of snakes i don't want to get bitten by one but yeah. i that that overwhelming fear of snakes and serpents completely gone wow but there yeah. is this uh it's interesting that you're saying that this is something that is uh uh widespread this same conceptual that that's got to tell us something that there is something outside of just the brain's interaction of of uh perceptions because if many people across broad spectrums are having serpent uh reactions or interactions that means that we are encountering something beyond ourselves right yes. because m- multiple people are, that that's something scientifically we can uh, put into perspective because multiple people are having this exact same experience without knowing that others are having this exact same experience. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the serpent itself and your understanding uh, from all this, what can you explain to me about that? Well, you know, the first thing to notice is that how, uh, is how prevalent the idea of a, a serpent is as a, uh, creator god in many ancient uh, traditions and, and civilizations. Um, so the aborigines in, in Australia, 
they they look upon the the, the great uh, creator God is the rainbow serpent, and if you uh, if you go to Amazonas, uh, which uh, I did and several other people w- did who who want to do the ayahuasca ceremonies there, they have a mythology saying that the great anaconda created the human beings. And uh, if you go to ancient Egypt, you have the cosmic serpents are being portrayed in many different uh, uh, reliefs. And uh, of course, everybody has heard about the story about the serpent in the Bible and and its confrontation with the the Yahweh. And uh, then the the whole uh, idea is much more uh, accessible to is actually through uh, studying what the ancient peoples in 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 Mexico and Guatemala uh, were thinking. Uh, they they devoted their their main pyramids to this entity they called the the plumed serpent, the the you know the commonly visited uh, uh, tourist site or uh, ancient. Uh, um, city of Chichen Itza, uh, in its center it has this pyramid that is dedicated to the plumed serpent. And what used to be the world's largest pyramid in Cholula in, in Mexico was dedicated to the same entity. So uh, there we have some, uh, I mean, there there must be a reason for uh, this role of, of the serpent. And of course, it was used in all kinds of magic and uh, th- that too. But that's a little bit uh, uh, another level of, of, of using it. But it was a u- significant uh, entity of creation in, in, in um, uh, mythologies uh, or that's, cosmologies all over the world. That is, uh, again, so powerful a statement because during one of the revelations I had, um, I, you know, my, my arms, I, I don't know how to explain it. My arms were folded up over me and my body was convulsing from my feet upward. And the, the, the people that were there, the facilitators and, and uh, the other aides were watching this. I said at one point during this, oh, I realized I was being birthed through the snake. Um, wow. And it, it was this giant anaconda-like deal that I was being pushed out through. And I, I, I felt like, and I said, I, I, I remember telling her, I get it, I get it, I'm, this is rebirthing. The snake is nothing to be afraid of. This is a part of the birthing process, um, spiritually. And it was just such a, a mind-altering, expansive moment for me. Uh, and, and so many different layers of the snake uh, and how it plays out through my life and, and what the power behind it meant. And then for you to say that it's been you know considered part of creation, and I completely felt that way. I felt as though it was this birthing moment, this birthing process. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, the the, but it's really then if we try to make it uh, to, uh, describe it in modern terms, we could say that it's a wave. And uh, w- when you think about it, if, if you, how do you symbolize a sine wave in a world if you have no you know, computers that can just automatically do it or, or have trigonometric tables or something like that. Well, the, the most uh, obvious symbol is actually a serpent or a snake because when it moves, it moves like a sine wave, like a wave. And uh, that's, so if, if we talk about this in modern terms, I would say it's a quantum wave. And those quantum waves um, uh, that the Maya would explain uh, exactly when they would turn into uh, peaks and when they would turn into valley in, in the history of the universe and the history of mankind. Um, uh, th- those w- were, um, th- they influenced human civilization through the effects that they had on the human mind. Um, because humans download these waves, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, it's fundamental for uh, our entire existence and, and the kind of reality that we are creating around us. So these waves have largely been ignored and denied by um, modern science uh, and, and many others uh, as well. But it's, it's just very, very ap- apparent that 
uh, to ancient peoples in uh, in Mexico and and Guatemala, not only the Maya, there are several other peoples in that region who would also honor the plumed serpent. That they saw that as the bringer of life, they saw it as the bringer of of civilization. And uh, it's it's just brought a, a thought patterns to uh, human beings that became uh, crucial for everything that we create and how we perceive reality uh, and so forth. So it doesn't surprise me, you know, the fact that and you 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 tell very good examples of this. That, but it's it's just a general. Uh, um, st- studies have shown that the most commonly experienced uh, vision that people have when taking ayahuasca is that of serp- a serpent or many serpents or or so forth. Uh, they are there, and but the, you know that's really these waves. The only way we can sort of experience or see them is is probably then as as serpents, as as we would do in these kind of altered states. Could we, if you don't mind now, I mean, this is fascinating. I love this, but I, I'd like to examine, if we could, the pineal gland. Can you really explain to me and, and kind of break it down for our audience in, in an understandable way? What exactly is the pineal gland and what is its importance, not not metaphysically, but just for the physical uh, part of our body and, and brain? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is a... Um it's a very small organ. Um, it's uh, about five to eight uh, millimeters long, and it has the the shape of a pine cone, and it's located in the center of the brain. And what's special? There are a couple of of things that are special about it. Um, one is that it's the only unpaired uh, part of the human brain. Or everything else is sort of mirror images on the two hemispheres of the brain. But the, the pineal gland is unpaired. Another very interesting fact is that it contains uh, calcium crystals. So it, and uh, they're just only in the inner ear that you, that's the only other place where you have crystals in, in the body, I think, or at least in the brain. So for some reason there, at the center of the brain, there is a little organ unpaired that has crystals. And uh, uh, if we go to modern science, uh, it's, I, it's been shown that uh, th- this particular gland then plays a, uh, an, an important role in the sw- sleep-wake cycle. So uh, what, it hap- what happens is that when the light goes out and the night starts, then this little gland starts to secrete uh, the hormone melatonin. And that's really then what what helps us go to sleep. And some people take that as a help to get to sleep. So that's as far as as uh, modern science would would pl- place its important that it it regulates the uh, um, uh, the sleep wake cycle. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> so if you go to another time zone and you th- then you know it will adjust your a sleep wake cycle in accordance to when the day and the night begins there but then the the curious thing then is really then that the, it has played such an important role in in ancient mythologies and uh, <clears throat> well can I, can I ask one thing before yeah. you go into that yeah uh, obviously we've been studying the brain for centuries has there been any evidence that um evolutionary wise uh, the the pineal gland is shrinking, going away as we're not seeming to uh, utilize it as much as maybe we did or our our uh, ancestors did. Uh, is it becoming less important, like um, an appendix or a, a tail or something on on humans, or has it always remained the same through history? Well, you know, nobody would be able to exactly know that. I don't think anyone doubts that it has um, um, changed over the the 
no, I don't think anyone claims that it's undergone any change throughout the existence of the human being. Uh, what I point, point out in this book, however, is that uh, evolutionary, in, in a longer perspective, going back to our uh, you know, to amphibians or, or reptiles and, and uh, uh, other people that are forerunners to the human beings, the, the pineal gland uh, was really like a third eye that was outside of the, of the brain. So it was actually a functioning uh, third eye. Um, but then what has happened over the course of, of uh, evolution through different kinds of species uh, is that rather than um, being in the center of the head, uh, uh, oh, sorry, rather than being on the top of the head as the pineal, uh, the third eye used to be uh, in amphibians, it will be moved to the center of the head in human beings. And there it can't see direct light uh, uh, in contrast to these amphibians that preceded us. And uh, I think the fact that it's in, in human beings uh, is exactly in the center of the brain and is an, uh, um, an unpaired organ uh, provides an explanation to uh, to the role that it has um, so the, the way I look upon it is that it's, it's primarily an anchoring point for the downloading of the mind um, so we're coming back to to my view that I we talked about earlier that that the you know the mind is really something we download it doesn't come from the brain but the brain downloads it but then this this mind it has to be positioned correctly in relation to the brain matter so to speak and it does so because that the the geometry of the mind that is downloaded it gets anchored at that central point of the brain, uh, which which is then the 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 pineal gland. Does the um, I, I get that? So consciousness uh, exists in, in your belief outside of who we are, uh, that, or maybe consciousness is the wrong information, uh, wrong way to place that but the the pineal gland is, is working basically as the router to get the information that's downloaded yeah. into the brain so this consciousness this information that exists exists not within us as we think but it's out there and stored outside of us as well right so is it creating a conduit like a uh a, 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 an ethereal internet yeah exactly yes yeah all right now i'm also curious of all the research that's been done, has it ever been made public what the brain looks like during these uh, transformative measures when somebody is using plant medicine? Has anybody been wired up to see if uh, the brain sparks, what, what parts of the brain become more active uh, or perhaps inactive that might explain to us why some of these um, simulations uh, appear to take place? Yes, it has. And it's pretty recent work by uh, a group at the Imperial Co College in, in London um, that has studied um, by um, this um, uh, fun uh, functional imaging uh, technique. Um, they've studied what, uh, what parts of the brains are active. And they, so they've, they've studied that under the influence of LSD, of psilocybin, and also uh, without, with the controls, of course. And what they find then is, is that the number of connections between the different brain uh, uh, compartments uh, are are increasing under the influence of um, psychedelics. So that's uh, that's uh, that's a very interesting uh, uh, finding, I, I would say. So you know what what that means is that, um, as I understand it, that. You take a, a psychedelic, 
And then what happens is that the mind gets, that, that really is what compartmentalizes the brain. The mind compart our, our normal default uh, um, uh, mind, de it, it, it compartmentalizes our brain. So if we take this substance, it decompartmentalizes the brain. And as that happens, all the connections are being uh, produced between all these different uh, brain parts that normally are are separate or working in in separation. So that happens, and it, it takes you know as long as there is a the effect of of the of the substance you've taken, uh, there is an integrate. There is a potential of an integration uh, between the different brain parts that isn't there under normal circumstances. In engaging the uh, the aspects that we do through plant medicines and psychedelics, are there other ways to stimulate that uh, low low level uh, uh, electricity, uh, electromagnetic fields, anything else that can stimulate it without the uh, without ingesting the the chemicals or the the plants themselves? Well, you know, if if we look at uh, this. Uh, decompartmentalization of the brain as the goal. If we look at that as opening up uh, 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 the potential to, to create some integration of our experiences uh, of the cosmos, then you can say, yes, it seems clear that psychedelics have that potential. It can create that change in the human mind and, and transfer it to another state of mind. Um, but then <clears throat> the, the, an interesting aspect of this is that they, they've studied this kind of uh, brain patterns uh, also in, in, in meditators, and they find a, a fairly similar kind of uh, uh, um, integration or, or increased uh, connections between the different kind of uh, 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 brain compartments. Uh, so what, what I'm saying here is then really that uh, taking a substance, or um, uh, plant medicine or, or psychedelics or whatever difficult word we were, we are going to use to, to right. describe it, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not something entirely distinct from other types of uh, um, methods that people have to uh, go to some altered or, or sacred space in, in, in their mind. Uh, meditation would be one. There is something called holographic, holotropic breath work. Uh, th there are... are um, um, what shall I say, kundalini yoga. I mean, I think there's a whole range of, of uh, uh, spiritual practices, you might call, that they're not identical. The effects are not identical with a, uh, with a psychedelics I I experience. And obviously, there is, there is something special with the fact that uh, the, the psychedelic locks you into a state for a period of time, whether you like it or not, so to speak. Whereas, you know, a, a meditation, you can just end it. Or, or So, so I, I would say that all of, uh, or a range of different spiritual practices represent a variation of a theme. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not identical, but yes, they, I think they're all uh, acting in order to uh, decompartmentalize the brain and create an opening to a more cosmic experience of, of uh, uh, reality. And uh, uh, one reason I think it's important to point that out is that you know the perception ha has been, and maybe especially so after the 60s and, uh, and all the wild things people were doing in, in those days, was that uh, uh, plant medicines or psychedelics was something completely different from, uh, say, meditation or, or some other uh, spiritual practice people may have. It doesn't look like that. It looks like 
they related. These experiences are, are related. They're not identical, but they are variations of a theme. I, I, I wish I, I said this on the episode. I wish that everybody could have the experience I had, not my exact experience, but have that same enlightenment, that same download, because it is, it's virtually impossible in words to convey how different it is than yeah. what people's perceptions are. Yeah. Um, it's not just being stoned. It's not just, <laughs> uh, you know, hallucinating it, yeah. uh, the impact, the power, the everything, the, uh, uh, every aspect of it made you realize just how, you know, how cohesive everything is and how close we all are. And, and again, this all sounds hippy dippy. And now I know why, because this is what the hippies have been talking about all along and, and they have a reason for it. Cause if they've been dipping into this realm, I wish I would have found it sooner because it is, it is life altering. And I, boy, I could only imagine, um, I did not have any issues with waves of depression or anxiety after my, uh, journey yeah. for weeks. Now that was before we were plunged into our current situation. <laughs> right. Uh, if, if yeah. you're not human, if you're not dealing with some anxiety and fear at exactly. this point, but I can tell that it's not nearly as impactful as it would have been prior to me having that journey. Um, and realizing, you know, uh, that there's something much grander going on. I don't know how all this is going to play out, nor would I ever uh, try to suppose to our listeners that, oh, feel, you know, everything's going to be okay. Everything is as it needs to be, because that sounds very dismissive to the terror mm -hmm. that's going on our planet right now. But it certainly gave me a different perspective on the way I am absorbing the information that's coming in. And it's, it is keeping me calmer and more at peace uh, and not because I feel like I'm above this virus or that my family is above it, but it, there, I, there's just something inside you that changes and it, 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 I would love to do it again because I'd like more reinforcement of that, um, to, to put us back in. You talk about the evolutionary changes in these, these kind of quantum levels. Have oh, we just found a second? Can I please, uh, please just go in there? Yeah, I share that experience. I had a couple of, of psychedelic experiences just in in January, um, and um, and it, that, it where I actually would go through my have an experience of my death, uh, my own death. And, uh, uh, you know, yes, uh, I share your experience that you can't just dismiss or ignore the, the, the world situation t today. But I, I, I must say that, that my particular fear of death has been considerably decreased through having these uh, experiences. And I still don't want to go through the pain of, of dying, but, but my, not, not the same kind of, a, uh, because you actually are, in my case anyway, you get to see something, you get to see what, what happens at, at death, or at least as much as we can b believe about that. And that makes it less uh, uh, dangerous somehow. So thank you for bringing that up. It is. Uh, and, you know, like my lifelong fear had always been of death, and I came away with a totally different take on it. Yeah. And maybe that's the calming influence over me at this point. Not that I'm, like you said, not that I'm asking for it. I'm in no rush to no. get there, nor do yeah. I want anybody I know or love to, to get there. But it's a different uh, sense of uh, acceptance, where before it was completely devastating and damning, I feel very different about that altogether so it, it it is uh it is fascinating and and there to me there's i, I hate i don't know how to write use these words properly but there is no sense i can relate to somebody to how that is just imagine um knowing a deep dark secret and finally you're able to tell somebody and just that kind of God, I'm just mm -hmm. glad it's out there. I'm glad it's not in me and a part of me anymore. It's out there, part of the universe. That's kind of how I feel now about death. It's no longer this this burning ember of fear uh, that's inside of me. It's been released, and and mm -hmm. I, I, that's the only thing I can kind of relate it to. Um, yeah. Now, when we were you were discussing the the quantum levels of consciousness, mm -hmm. is there yeah. is there any measurable? Uh, is there anything scientifically measurable that we can show? 
uh, people see, no, these do exist. I know there's the theory of, of quantum mechanics and, uh, quantum theories exist, but, uh, you know, what are the actual principles in place to prove that these theories are more than just theories? Yeah, well, um, what, what I'm talking about here is the macrocosmic uh, uh, quantum theory. Uh, in, in other words, that the entire cosmos is undergoing shifts between different states of, um, uh, of uh, quantum states. Um, the in terms of measurable things, uh, as far as I know, there are no techniques to to measure those, um, um, and it, there may never be. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, you know, the the, the I, I would say that the historical evidence, when you start to match the occurrence in time to these quantum state and how the human civilizations and the human beings were changed at those particular shift points, I, I think that's a, it's, it's a very strong uh, evidence. Uh, and... Uh, it really explains why uh, people's, you know, s relatively suddenly 5,000 years ago uh, went from being uh, uh, simple farmers to building huge pyramids and uh, creating calendars and, and uh, creating cities. And, you know, uh, uh, suddenly civilization came into existence at the time of one of these quantum states. And I, I would say that the easiest way of the, the most uh, immediate way of explaining that is by referring to a cosmic quantum state that changed the minds of people. And so suddenly, you know, this structured, uh, uh, geometrically structured mind came into existence that we we're still living with it. But without it. People were in a much more sort of floating state uh, before this. But once you download that, that um, structured mind, then the beginning of, of civilization begins. Basically, it is like as inside, so outside. The change that occurs through downloading uh, one of these quantum states from the cosmic center, uh, that gets to be expressed outside through the creativity of, of the, the human beings. Um, I think uh, th this book, um, if anything, it provides too much of evidence that this is really the, 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 the case. But um, yeah, that uh, evolution really is a product of a, a stepwise uh, climb of of like the like a pyramid or a pagoda as ancient people would symbolize this they would make terrace pyramids and the reason they built terrace pyramids was that e between each of these levels there is a quantum shift a quantum leap uh, if you like, whether that will ever be possible, I don't know. I mean, there are there. I don't know. There was a time when people thought it was completely impossible to to prove, measure the existence of gravity waves, and now that was proven uh, four years ago or something like that. After a very long time of hypothesizing uh, the existence of those based on phenomena that you can observe. In this case, you can you can uh, connect these uh, quantum shifts that the Mayan uh, people would uh, describe. Um, you can connect it with all kinds of ch uh, changes in, in cosmic history, but whether it will be possible to actually measure a cosmic wave, uh, I don't know. It hasn't happened yet. When. We're in these altered states of consciousness and receiving this information in downloads. Um, and, and you're doing the research for this book and, and piecing this together with what we know of the past and, and how the Mayans and other cultures have examined these uh, enlightenments. We're Obviously, we've talked about a couple of the commonalities and threads, and I'd like you to maybe go into that a little bit more. But what were some of the... Um, what were some of the changes or, or things that don't seem to align 
uh, with different cultures? Is is there different aspects regarding belief systems going into an experience like this? Oh, you mean like researching the the different uses in, in different shamanic cultures of, of how um, these kind of medicines were used? Is that well, it? Like, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Let me try to figure out how to formulate this. So uh, Dave Schrader grew up uh, Lutheran in Minnesota, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Tim, yes. Tim Dennis grew up Catholic in Chicago. Uh, yep. You know, Guy, Guy Hammernick grew up, um, uh, you know, Islamic in, uh, you know, in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, if we all take this drug with our different belief systems, is there a divergent point where some of it is very linear? Uh, but then, uh, you know, so you could say, look, we know this commonality thread bleeds between all of these experiences, which shows us that it's much more than just a hallucinatory experience because everyone's having this. That means we must be tapping into this. But then are there aspects where it becomes divergent that because of my pre-believed concepts going one direction, I'm going to have a different uh, deal than maybe my Islamic friend or my Catholic friend or my Jewish friend that would be having the same experience with the same plant medicine? Yeah, well, uh, you know, as I understand it, uh, I mean, one thing that is so noticeable about this uh, using plant medicines is, is the wide variety of, of kind of experiences people uh, uh, can have. Uh, there are no two same experiences. The, the possibilities are more, more or less endless, uh, and they created by the uh, you know, complex uh, interference patterns of waves that we are are uh, downloading. Um, but uh, um, and then there is a saying. You know, this is more like a saying in in the uh, therapeutic uh, uh, meaning of 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 psychedelics. It's really that you 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 get what you need, not what you want from this kind of a journey or experience of the, uh, the other world or an altered state or, or, or so forth. And uh, what, what that means is that <clears throat> maybe to some extent then whatever predispositions you have religiously or, or so forth, that that will guide a little bit what your individual per, uh, personal experience will t- turn out to be. Uh, I couldn't say anything in in general because I I would think that you know the cosmos will focus on on somebody and and give he, her or him what she or he needs regardless of if it's a Jew a Muslim or a a, a, a Christian. Um, but I would say that you know regardless of of that kind of. Uh, a religious predisposition that you have, I think moving into this uh, world and having a, a, um, a direct personal experience of uh, uh, th- that you have a, a visionary experience, uh, uh, it will really it will also change your relationship to your religions. Um, you will you will have your personal. This is what the co- cosmos told me. You will be able to say, and then you will have to make a choice. You know, is this really consistent with with the religion I, I'm predisposed by? And and then you could say, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you have a choice. You could say. Uh, uh, no, it's not. I'll choose the religion because that's, uh, you know, whatever. Or you might say, well, maybe I should go by my personal experience and try to uh, see what that meant to, to teach me. And uh, I, I don't think that the cosmos groups people uh, like, oh, here we have the Jews, they should get that reli- that experience. Here we have the Muslims, they should get the, the, another experience, or here we have the Christians, so they should give the, a special experience. I don't think that's really how, the, uh, how it works. I, I think um, you're, you have a, uh, you're downloading a, a, a personal uh, interference pattern of, of uh, uh, waves that are connecting you to the uh, cosmos. And, uh, and that will uh, give you if you if you're 
taking these substances in a in an appropriate context where, where it's sacred or at least it's uh, it's not just playful or 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 like that uh, then i think it will give you what you need yeah i just like i said i was just curious along the lines of what are the similarities between experiences and the divergent points? But, you know, I, I understand it's also subjective. Each person goes into it. You know, I, I specifically was asked by the facilitator and shaman, what one word did I want to bring to my journey? Mine was uh, forgiveness. And, mm. and as I was led through that journey, I touched on many different things, but I realized how intertwined love, forgiveness, um, kindness, all of this were all important in my overall healing. So there was this different aspect, but forgiveness became the prominent aspect of my journey. Now, somebody else who was yeah. there had love or health or, or, you know, different aspects and they got something else different. So I understand there's going to be those divergent points, but I just didn't know if there's a, you know, you said serpents play a main stay in many of these experiences. Yeah. Uh, I just wondered though, in another culture, would it be maybe, uh, the bear is more prevalent or, um, you know, uh, uh, and I apologize. I, I can't remember the name of the character, the Hindu character that's like an elephant head with multiple arms. Would that be more of their experience as opposed to the uh, Ganesh? Yeah. Ganesh. Would yeah. that be more important, yeah. you know, be more prevalent yeah. as opposed to the serpent oh, I see. Yeah. because of our, our predisposed belief systems? Yeah, probably in, in some extent, you know, because, you know, if you're an Indian, uh, you will know the meaning of Ganesh uh, more than, uh, uh, say, the meaning of Thor. Uh, and uh, if the cosmos wants to give a message to you, it's, it's probably more appropriate to give it through Ganesh than to give it through Thor. Oh, sure, through a recognizable form. You know, that that opens up another concept that I've talked about for many years on the show is the fact that some of us will experience ghost encounters or angelic encounters when i when i had an uh, uh, a, a, an encounter with my grandfather after his death to me at face value it was my grandfather i went to hug him goodbye and it was like i grabbed a shaft of vibrating hot air mm. and i i backed away and he said oh i'm sorry you're not used to that and he said okay now and then i hugged him and i could feel skin and bone and and shirt and everything yeah. um and then afterwards, I started thinking, was that really my grandfather that came to me? Or was yeah. it an angelic form that took the form of something that I would listen to, right? If I saw an angel floating there in a white gown and, and mist, would I just dismiss it most likely afterwards being like, oh, my God, I was drunk or high or well, you know, sleep deprived. That's what that experience was all about. But because it came in the guise of my grandfather and gave me a message, it was more acceptable. So – you know, I wonder if that is part of the aspect of the supernatural is the way that it um, it presents itself to us is in the meanings that we would make the most sense of. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and, and there will never be any certain answer to that, I, I would say. But, you know, just look upon it as the cosmos giving, it, giving you your grandfather – through an angel, I mean, it's, it was. What's the difference, so to speak? Um, um, I do in in my book. I do elaborate uh, theoretically on the existence of of spirits and and ghosts and and so forth, and uh, um, basically saying that uh, our we, as we, as living beings, so to speak, we we exist in a physical form. But what I, what I'm developing quite in detail is, is that you know we're we're actually waveforms. There is an underlying waveform to all of our existence, and so when uh, that that waveform, uh, which uh, uh, may exist past our, uh, our physical existence. I mean, this is, of course, what, what a lot of, uh, uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, religions and spiritual traditions have been saying. The only difference here, really, that I'm, I'm making a, a, a case uh, through um, a, a new theory of biological evolution and, and what, that, that ultimately there is an underlying uh, wave pattern that underlies the way we are shaped. And 
once we die, that that uh, um, th- that waveform still may survive um, in the quantum field, so to speak, and and that's what you know you may experience and so forth. Uh, you know, I, I of course you your personal emotional experience is the important part of this, but. But I, I do want to say that uh, this book does contain a, a quite r- rigid uh, uh, scientific explanation as to why uh, these kind of ghosts or spirits or so forth actually exist. They have to exist. If, if well, let's, you... let's do this. We have to take a quick break. Uh, Dr. Carl Kalaman, our guest, when we come back, I'd like to di- dive into that a little bit deeper. The book, again, is called Quantum Science of Psychedelics, The Pineal Gland, Multidimensional Reality, and Mind Cosmology. We have a link to that book in today's program, so you can order it. Make sure when you do order it, you rate and review the book so that it gets a higher um, uh, higher face on Amazon and more and more people can see it. Stay tuned. We'll be back with more of the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. This is Darkness Radio. You know, I got to laugh. I'm still getting the messages. Tim, are you serious? Is this for real? Are you really, really using feels? Yes, I'm using feels. Yes, I feel better. Yes, I don't have as much pain as I used to have. Yes, yes, it's all real. (sighs) I can't believe you guys don't believe me. I'm telling you, two eyedroppers a day. I take one in the morning when I wake up because, of course, I got my morning pain. I know you have your morning pain as well. And yes, I take one at night before I go to bed because, let's face it, I want to get rid of that stress and that anxiety and I want to get to bed and I want to sleep more than just an hour or an hour and a half at a time. So yes, I take feels one eyedropper at a time. That's my dosage. And yes, I get the big vial of feels. And I've had a lot of you, and and thank God, I've had a lot of you message me and ask me. And I'm glad you do. Tim at darknessradio.com, if you ever have any questions about feels. I'm glad you asked me those questions about feels, because that means you're interested in feels. I know you experience stress. I know you have that anxiety. I know a lot of you experience a chronic pain. You have trouble sleeping at least once a week. I know you're not alone. That's why I do these messages. I know you're in pain. I know you've got stress. I know you've got anxiety. I've told you about my pain. We've gone over it week after week after week. My back, my neck, my knees, my ankles, Everything but the tip of this this left pinky I've told you about hurts. Everything. And it's always an 8 to a 10. But I tell you what, with feels, I've decreased that pain. I'm starting to sleep better. The anxiety that I have with chronic pain. You know the anxiety I'm talking about. That feeling that you know you're going to hurt. You know, once you decrease the pain, and you start to feel a little better. And you're like, but I know I'm going to feel worse. That anxiety, it's gone. Because I know that I've got a great relief in feels. Now, a lot of you may be saying, what is feels? Well, feels is premium CBD delivered directly to your doorstep. And feels naturally helps release stress, anxiety, pain, and sleeplessness. Feels has helped me with All of that, relieving the pain, relieving the stress, relieving the anxiety. I'll tell you, throughout this pandemic, a lot of people have been panicking. A lot of people have been feeling that anxiety. A lot of people have been feeling that stress. I'm not as stressed, not feeling that anxious. I'm actually taking things pretty easy. Not that I'm not worried about stuff, because we all are. But I'm feeling pretty good. It's real easy to take. I've told you guys before, this is how you're probably going to want to take it. When you first get feels, you're probably going to want to place a few drops of feels under your tongue and feel the difference within a few minutes. That's all it takes. The thing to remember, though, about CBD is that you're going to want to find your right dose. That's important. And everybody has a different dose. Depends on what your tolerance is. Leave some room to experiment over the course of a week or so. You may need to take more. You may need to take less. 
Depends on the effects that you're wanting to get. If you have any questions, Feels is really great about answering those questions, especially if you're new to CBD. Feels offers a free CBD hotline to help guide you through your personal experience. And the folks at Feels are amazing about being there for you through your CBD experience. You can feel better naturally. Feels works naturally to help you feel better. There's no high. There's no hangover. There's no addiction. I know a lot of you there that are in chronic pain have been through this. I kicked Vicodin myself. I know what it's like. You're not going to feel sluggish. You're not going to try and kick anything. CBD is all natural. There's no high. There's no come down. There's no jonesing. There's nothing. It's just a nice, easy relief of your pain. So how do you get into this? Join the Feels community and get Feels delivered to your door every single month. You'll save money on every order and you can pause or cancel at any time. It's that simple. Although I don't know why you would want to stop the relief of pain. I can't register that in my gut or in my head. I I don't know why you'd want to do that. Uh, feels has me feeling my best every single day. It can help you too. You can become a member today by going to feels.com slash darkness. And what we're going to do again, give you 50% off your first order with free shipping. That's F E A L S.com slash darkness to become a member and get 50% automatically taken off your first order with free shipping. Once again, this is how you do it. Feels.com slash darkness F-E-A-L-S dot com slash darkness. Do it today. Dr. Carl Kellerman, our guest, again, the book Quantum Science of Psychedelics. Uh, when you talk about having a scientific, astringent scientific uh, principles towards things like the supernatural ghosts and, and these, can you describe that a little bit more in depth to us? Because obviously being a paranormal themed show, uh, many of our listeners are believers and have had their own experiences or are not uh, experiencers yet, but want to have that. Uh, what what, yeah. what do you believe regarding the soul, the spirit and, and life outside of this physical form? Yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah, just f- again, just coming to back to my personal experience with psychedelics is that, you know, you do uh, start, you know, I have experienced just my my uh, my soul or whatever you want to call it outside of my physical body. And and of course, that's that's already an indication that, uh, that uh, maybe the the maybe the soul will not die with the body, so to speak. And we talked about earlier about that. Um, the, the, but then how, why would that be? And I think it has to do with the, uh, uh, how you look upon biological evolution or, 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 if you like, how biological species are created. And uh, I would say that the dominating theory in, in science today uh, which is starting a little bit to crumble, but basically that's the materialist, uh, Darwinist idea that you know everything is uh, random. All species are coming uh, into existence th- through random m- mutations uh, and, and so forth. And then, of course, in their view, uh, the uh, the soul and the mind and so forth are just produced. By, uh, is, sorry, uh, it's just produced by that biological that w- matter that we're made of. Now, I'm pre- presenting in this book another um, uh, theory of biological evolution, and that is that uh, these waves, these serpents that we talked about er- earlier, or when I say serpent, I'm just using that metaphor because that's what the ancient people would use. But these waves have created the different kinds of species. And you, you can track throughout the history of the universe how at peaks in these waves there is a burst of, of new kind of species coming into existence. And that's I, I uh, outline that in the book for anyone who wants to see the detail of, of this. Now, 
there are several different waves here and, and uh, um, several different uh, plumed serpents, uh, if I go back to the Mayan uh, way of languaging it, it. But then through the um, interference pattern between these different waves, you will get different kinds of, of the species emerging. And so, well, what that means is that if the species, the biological species, including ourselves, are products of waves, then that means that ultimately um, the, the, the blueprint from the, for the human being exists in a, in, in a, you could call it a quantum f field or an interference pattern of waves. And uh, that blueprint is, is sort of exists in a non-physical domain. Uh, and, and then, you know, you can discuss how the, it takes a physical form. Uh, but if there is such a blueprint as I'm uh, evidencing in, in this particular book, uh, if there is such a blueprint, well, then you have a blueprint which is a non-physical waveform, but yet you can say that's a living spirit. That blueprint exists. And uh, under certain sun, uh, conditions, including when you take uh, plant medicines or, in, uh, you know, you, you may for other reasons become temporarily in some kind of an altered state, uh, then you will actually have encounters with these blueprints that most people would refer to as spirits. But the point here is that... Mm, if you want to look upon this scientifically, you know, you have to basically dismiss the whole Darwinist idea that dominates, still dominates uh, the world today, which is that we're prim primarily material uh, uh, biological uh, matter that has come into existence by accident. I mean, that is the official view of, of, of science still today. But that completely changes if you look upon our biological uh, um, shapes and, and morphologies and anatomies as being reflections of a, of a blueprint that exists in an invisible quantum field that underlies it. And then once you accept that theory of evolution or of, of biological species, then it's just the, uh, to, to be open to the fact that sometimes in some altered states of consciousness, uh, you will be able to see these blueprints and, and encounter them. And, and that could be your grandfather or it could be... Uh, um, it could be an angel or it could be uh, all, all kinds of, of, of things that, uh, uh, you know, paran paranormal uh, experiences as, uh, as they refer to. But once you change the, the theory of biological evolution, there is nothing paranormal about it. There is nothing supernatural about it. It's just that our physical reality then becomes visible or understandable as a reflection of an underlying uh, uh, quantum field exists, uh, uh, sorry, blueprint existing in, in an in invisible quantum field. Wow, that's, uh, that's fascinating. You've got to pick up the book, folks, get deeper into this. Um, so many of you are fascinated by all the different aspects that we cover on the show. I think this book can certainly enlighten and open up your eyes to new concepts, beliefs, or find ways that the, the, the experiences you've already had may make more sense in doing this. Could I ask you, Dr. Kellerman, in, in your research, what was some of the most eye-opening and astonishing aspects that, that were revealed to you? Ah, who? Um, it, it, I know it's hard, right? Say, can it, you just tell us the biggest concept in the world and make it really simple? <laughs> no, but, <laughs> exactly. You know, yeah, right. I should. Oh, okay, so let me just tell you how it come. How I write a book. Uh, you know, I I I walk around and do nothing for for maybe a year or two, and uh, and then uh, something. It's like a book comes to me from the cosmos and tells me you're supposed to write me, and. Um, 
it, what what that means is that apparently I have through through my experiences in these couple of years in between, I, I have gathered enough of new material that it's time to formulate a, a, a new book, and then. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, you know, I don't know. I'm just guided in, in very often in completely remarkable ways to to find uh, what I would call the relevant uh, information for for the um, for for my particular for that particular book that wants to be written by me and nobody else because you're the one that sort of has that unique. Uh, 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 background, um, and I should say here, you know, in, in this case, uh, uh, I, it is a somewhat unique background because uh, not only do I have the my, my own cosmology that I devoted uh, certainly twenty years fully to, uh, I also have the the chemical pharmacological background that I also devoted twenty years to, and then much more recently, I've had these experiences with with. Uh, uh, plant medicines, uh, and um, then, you know, it just from my the specific background, particular background, then it just makes sense to try to explain this particular phenomenon, how you get transferred to different worlds uh, when you take a, a substance, which is really a strange thing in, in, in when, before you've done it, really, but, uh, but it does happen. Um, uh, I don't know exactly what what I should. Uh, it becomes a process where you just encounter thing after thing. Uh, um, just let me mention uh, the you know the finding of the the, the Maya. The ancient Maya, there have been inscriptions left behind. And uh, one of the interesting inscriptions is one that b describes actually the quantum shift that uh, took place the 3115 BCE. And uh, it, it talked about um, how some cosmic eight partitioning uh, uh, was tra transferred onto the earth or transposed uh, uh, onto the earth and uh, uh, with the direction of the northern uh, or the north. And, uh, you know, for, for somebody who hasn't uh, gone into this uh, or, or studied how the, the Mayan uh, waves will connect to human history that maybe sound very, very strange. What's this eight partitioning happening in the cosmos and going down to the earth and it, 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 with the direction of the north? Well, um, then, uh, you know, it dawned upon me at some point that, you know, the, the, the main pyramid in Giza, uh, which was built at that particular time, uh, it, it's, it's built in eight segments. It's an eight-sided pyramid. It's not four-sided. You might think superficially it's four-sided, but they built it in eight sides, uh, which is much more difficult than four sides to build it in. So, so it's slightly, um, so it's, it really does describe an eight partitioning. And as archaeologists have found, that particular pyramid is is perfectly, astoundingly uh, directed toward the north direction. So then I, you know, made the connection. Well, this is exactly a reflection. This particular pyramid, that's the most uh, uh, important p uh, building on the planet, maybe, is exactly a... a, a, a um, a reflection of the quantum shift that the Maya described took place in the cosmos as, as that particular time. And uh, that really made connections. Uh, that, that made it, me understand that what, what's happening in, on our particular history and, and, and the history of uh, uh, everything else is really something that, that's very much uh, conditioned by these uh, quantum states that we download 
And once we download them, we start to express them because we feel this is an expression of, of, the, of the cosmic purpose. So we'll have to big, build a big pyramid if you, if you lived at the time when this was first uh, uh, downloaded. So that's just an example of an, uh, an important in, uh, insight that I had. There's been so much work done around the world with psychedelics um, and examinations, and certainly here in the United States and abroad. Why are we not hearing more of the profound nature of what they found, do you think? Uh, and, and why is this not realizing the medicinal uh, and psychological help and aspects of, of what many of these plant medicines can do? Why aren't we examining it more? Is it really just as simple as you can't? You can't uh, patent a, a, a plant, so yeah. it just doesn't matter, and they don't want to take it that far. I, I, I'd hate to think that it's that rudimentary. But what's yeah. your what's your thought? Oh, I think there are many things involved. I mean, first of all, there has been a tremendous expansion of the kind of research that have has been performed, especially in the United States, in very reputable. Uh, um, uh, universities in, in the I would say in the past ten years, uh, and before that, uh, before the 1990s, there was simply a freeze on everything that uh, any kind of research on on these kind of substances, uh, and uh, <clears throat> so I, I would say yes, there is a, 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 a big expansion has taken place. It's become more. Uh, acceptable uh, for uh, uh, scientists to to do research about it, and you know, as as I uh, communicated about my book here, you know, I, I contacted uh, uh, Ronald uh, Griffiths, who uh, has done uh, uh, he's at Johns Hopkins. Uh, in Baltimore, and he has done a lot of research about that. And, and I found out that he was now the director of a department of psychedelics. And uh, that that's probably wouldn't have happened five years ago. Nobody would have dared to call their the department the department of psychedelics. But that's now happening in, in one of the more prestigious uh, uh, medical universities in the United States. So the, it is definitely changing. And the, uh, the uh, and, and it's, you know, and, and very much uh, so because of the research that people like him ha have been doing, showing that this is uh, effective against addiction, against depression, against obsessive compulsive disorders, and possibly other uh, ailments where people have just run into uh, uh, running in a, uh, in a rut, so to speak. But then, you know, you may wonder why was it uh, forbidden in the first case, and it's still uh, illegal in the, in the United States, the, the substances to, to use them. Um, and uh, of course they were. I mean, part of it is that there were uh, um, uh, uh, excessions, uh, excessive craziness happening to some extent in the 60s and 70s and so forth. But uh, there are other reasons for, for uh, from a uh, the perspective of, of a pharmacological uh, perspective, um, it's, uh, you know, it's not a good business. Um, it, it's a better business to have somebody take some antidepressant every day throughout their life. That's good business for a pharmacological company. It's not so good a business to have some substance that, you know, the person might take uh, when, he, when he or she needs it every year, every couple of months, or I, I don't know, but, but not, not like a daily uh, uh, prescription. So there, 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 there is that um, aspect of it. It's not good business, really. I think that's part of it. But then, you know, it might also be that... Uh, it's, it, it brings about a, a change in how uh, human beings look upon their existence and their relationship to other human beings. That, um, um, that may not be quite consistent with the 
uh, kind of hierarchical uh, social structure that that we have today. Uh, we uh, we may become more aware of how our mind structures are connected to these hierarchical structures of, of society and so forth. So I think there is also like a, a political, uh, religious uh, motivation that, that underlies uh, uh, the, the ban that, that uh, is still exists uh, re- regarding them. But things are changing. I, I don't think that's, there's no question of, uh, about that. I'm going to take you way out there for a moment, Dr. Kalman, if you don't mind. Do you think that if, um, and maybe maybe animals don't have the same brain system with the pineal gland or whatever, uh, but if if animals were given plant medicine this way, the mixtures of plant medicine this way, not just normal ingestion, but this, do you think that they would begin to develop a higher evolutionary thinking process, thought process, and um, perhaps even a conceptual communication skill. Yeah, yeah I, uh, uh, I, no, I don't think so. If I, if, if I just be uh, straight on it, but you know, I, I use, I, I remember seeing it one. Well, point that's good. Of, I just, I wanted to make sure that way the planet of the apes is not in our future here. That's all right. I wanted, wanted to do. Oh, okay, <laughs> that's good. That's good. No, that that would be something. You know, you take that. And but but I remember seeing these uh, spider webs that they so they had spiders, and they they uh, they had given the spiders. Uh, uh, alcohol, LSD, and uh, I can't remember, maybe, maybe hashish or something like that. And and the the spider webs were not as they usually are. They didn't have the normal structure, and the LSD the spider web was just out of this world. So you know, there's some. <laughs> Do you think before the uh, the spiders took the drugs, were they talking to their friends? Are like, I don't want to have a bad trip, man. You know, I'm afraid of humans. If I take this shot. <laughs> Right. They're, they're having spiders involved in this. Obviously, you're going to change the cosmology of their brains. So they're going to create new patterns and new things. Yeah. But is yeah. that just did you create brain damage? Is that why their structure changed? Was it geometrically less sound? Was it um, were, were the patterns less uh, important than the ones that would would not be subjected to this? Uh well, you know, in my argument, the mind is basically a geometric structure, and uh, and temporarily uh, uh, the 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 psychedelic will disengage that normal uh, geometric structure, and, and that disengagement is was allowed for allows for the integration of of experiences from the cosmos and so forth and just from that perspective it's not at all if they they may also the the spiders they also may also have a geometry of the mind it doesn't mean that that brain is destroyed because the uh, the the psychedelic acts on the interface the relationship between brain and mind but it would mean that temporarily for a certain point of time they would be lost in space and really wouldn't be able to orient themselves with their normal uh, geometry and that's what happens to humans too in in my theory and the, as i'm presenting it in, in this book if if um has there been any work or research on the fact of multiple people having journeys at the same time connecting in <clears throat> not just the woo woo uh, yeah hypothetical, but in legitimately connecting in a uh, communicative way in that ether that that we've been able to bring back and and uh, examine it all. I, I think so, and I'm sorry I can't uh, I can't re- uh, um, tell you uh, about it. I, I don't remember or uh, so forth. I, I, I you reminded me. I sh- I need to study that. I think there there are studies like that. There are studies of uh, or, or at least exper- anecdotal experiences of people in a group in uh, ayahuasca that for some reason have some common theme uh, taking place. Um, but I, but I wouldn't go in. Uh, yeah, I don't know enough about it to talk about it. But it's an interesting question. It has been addressed, I'm sure. Um, 
what do you want to bring to the listeners and and readers of your book around the world with this? What what is your uh, overall hopes for this book to bring to them? Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Uh, good. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's very important today, today especially maybe, um, to convey that there is actually a cosmic time plan, and. Uh, and that is constituted by a series of different quantum states that we can resonate with. And uh, I think it's very important in, in dealing with the uh, critical situations uh, to, to know that, you know, at least there is, there is a purpose, there is a, there is a meaningful direction for all of this evolution. And that can be explained by the shifting quantum states that are activated through uh, um, evolution. That's one thing, uh, uh, that I, and I th think that's very important. Um, the other thing is, is uh, that uh, um, the, the use of psychedelics, um, it's not completely different from other types of spiritual practices as, as we talked about earlier. But it's one of those spiritual practices that allows you to go in the direction of what the, the cosmic plan outlines for us. It opens up a healing possibility by integrating aspects of ourselves that we have uh, uh, shut down or things that are influencing us and uh, it, it also opens up uh, uh, the whole experience that life here on, on the planet is just not a um, material accident is really part of, of a cosmic plan and uh, um, you know as part of that and I know a lot of other people uh, have done that uh, you know it's just to, to, to talk about the, the, the possible um, uh, therapeutic benefits that may come out of this use. Uh, and uh, it's going in the direction of actually educating uh, therapists today to, in order to, to um, help facilitate, be present with people that are dealing with depressions, dealing with uh, addictions and, and, and other kinds of, of uh, 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 negative uh, conditions uh, okay. that, that w w may have. So it's, it's all, all of these, but it's also integrated. What, what's really new about this or unique about this book is that the, the, the whole concept of psychedelics is not looked upon as, uh, as isolated, not only from other uh, spiritual practices, it's not looked upon as isolated from the cosmic plan. I, I actually make the case that it's part of the cosmic plan to use that in a responsible way in order to further your own personal um, uh, development. I, I hope that you guys will pick up the book, take a look at it for yourself, um, and educate yourself. This is so much of what uh, our listeners love and they're fascinated by and taking it to a different uh, level and, and examining these things with more of a scientific background. Um, somebody that's not just a, a hippie shaman out there, but actually has uh, a background in this field and understanding what it is that we're dealing with. Um, you know, when you've got a doctor in, in physical biology helping to break this down for you a little bit more, so many of you are always asking for that science of these aspects. This book is going to cover that very deep and, and in depth for you. Dr. Kalman, thank you so much for giving some of your time for us today and, and hoping, uh, or, or helping us open up our listeners to these concepts and, and hopefully uh, their own eyes into, into this evolutionary change. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. We, it was really very meaningful uh, discussion, I, I thought. I did too as well. Thank you so much. Remember, folks, get the book, rate and review it on Amazon. Let the rest of the world know about the uh, the book. We'll be back again with more of the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. Remember to check in Tuesdays for the best in True Crime Talk Radio, True Crime Tuesday with Dave and Tim. You've been listening to the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. This is Darkness Radio. Darkness Radio.